Recording in progress. Um, um, so the so other the thing, other to, thing know to know about this, about this is, that is that I have notes, I have notes for this, for this and, um, and um, they were sent around. around. You, you can you have can... that link, and I'll remind you again about the link later. But if you want to write it down, this is the link. It's kind of long, so don't bother doing that. I'll tell you how you can get the recording. I'll tell you how you can get the slides. Um, and with all that preamble, let's start talking about artificial intelligence. So um, the breakthrough here that's happened in the past couple of years is the result of the confluence of several different things. One, computers are getting more capable uh, computationally, and this computational power that's at the max level um, to support this AI has to be centralized for now, but pretty soon it'll probably be able to be something that can be loaded into um, your own computer. That'll help with a lot of things related to privacy and all kinds of things like that. But for now, it depends on this centralized computational power. Um, the internet is a big factor because you have to access that computational power. And the internet, of course, these days is pretty reliable. It's fast. It's pretty accessible from lots of places. Um, the other key thing that goes with the computational power is large databases, which you may have heard the term LLMs. And of course, we lawyers always think of that as the degree that you get for advanced legal study. But LLMs refer to large language models. We'll talk about that. And then finally, the key part of all this is the algorithms that detect patterns, sort through things, and also algorithms that self-improve. So AI is trained by humans, it's made better by humans, but mostly it's learning on its own and it's getting better at doing that. And that's what causes a lot of people to get scared and think it's gonna take over the world, which I don't think is gonna be a problem anytime soon. But depending on how you feel about the way the world is now, maybe that would be a good thing. Anyway, all right, so here's how we're gonna proceed. Uh, we are going to learn uh, by observing this generative AI, because that's what ChatGPT is, that's what these tools are, it's called generative AI. And you're going to see it in action. Now, some of you may have used this already or be using it. Um, in my experience, it seems like about 20% of lawyers around that number um, are using it. And that comes from a lot of different data, like Clio um, has has uh, surveyed people. I deal with a lot of lawyers continually. I always ask them. And it seems like around 20 to 25% is the number. I'm sure it'll go up. But you know, I have to assume that a lot of people here have not used it at all. So I wanna make sure everybody gets a chance to see it. And those of you who have seen it, this will give you a chance to see see it again and see it some more. All right, so we're gonna do that. And then um, I will explain to you how, what you are seeing when I demonstrate it, how it works or how we can understand how it works. I'm not gonna give the boring detailed explanation and I probably wouldn't even be able to give a good enough one there because I'm not a computer scientist, but I do know generally how it works and I know how we need to think about it. Um, I'll answer any questions you have if we have time for that or if that's something, you know, if somebody raises their hand and, and Jay wants to type it into the meeting chat, I can answer questions if you want to pose them. Um, and then I will explain at the end how you can keep up with the rapid developments. But all of that is in that document that I put a link to. That's kind of where I put things as they develop because they are developing really quickly. And I like to keep up and kind of have a centralized place where I store that. So you have access to that as well. So let's uh, begin with ChatGPT, and this is what the interface looks like. ChatGPT is run by a company called OpenAI, which has a strong partnership with Microsoft. Um, and there are the older version of ChatGPT was 3.5. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go up there and change it to 4, which is the more powerful model. And this is, a, I'm showing you a recording. I've pre-recorded this just, you know, to eliminate errors or problems. So what I did was I asked GP, chat GPT to give me kind of a summary of what I should talk about. And I, I didn't, I'm not going to actually use this, but I wanted you to see, like, if you were to say, oh, I'm going to talk to some lawyers about the impact of generative AI on the legal profession, and I have 15 minutes to speak, what should I say? So here we go. Uh, what should we say? I'm going to click this button, fire it up. And this is in, you know, represents what happened when I click this, you'll see it generating its response. That's why it's called generative AI. So it's generating a response. Uh, and I didn't tell it to say introduction five minutes. It's just, it figured that out. It's decided it's going to do that. Um, and it's it's pretty cool. If you look at it, it's saying, okay, begin with an overview of the evolution. 
uh, define generative AI, um, you know, talk about the impact on the legal profession for about 20 minutes, spend 10 minutes on the opportunities, spend 10 minutes on the challenges. I'm going to keep going here um, and let it keep going. And all I'm doing is pausing the recording and having it go forward. Uh, ethical considerations, obviously, that's super important. Um, Q&A, reserve time. So it's, you know... I, I, you know, if this is the first time you've seen this, you know, your jaw has to be dropping because mine was when I when I saw it. And I still am amazed and I've seen it do this a bunch of times and it just still constantly amazes me. So how do we think about this? Well, OK, again, let's think about what's going on. ChatGPT is a generative AI tool and generative means it generates responses on the fly to questions that you pose to it. And ChatGPT is what's known as a frontier model. It was the first frontier model, meaning it was the first one that did this really well. Um, there are now two other frontier models that are equally uh, at parity with ChatGPT currently. Um, so it is a generative AI tool. That's the frontier model. And the thing about generative AI is it's good at a lot of different things. But um, in order to give you the best thing that it's good at for most people, for everybody, is it helps you kind of, the term I'll use is ideate, mean brainstorm, come up with ideas. So um, that's its main thing. Like it's, that's where it doesn't go off the rails. That's where it can help you a lot. But of course that it's gonna help you in proportion to the quality of your thinking, right? Like if you're not really good at thinking things through and you think at a superficial level, it'll give you things, but then you probably will just accept them as blind truth, not question them not generally a good idea with anything, including computers. So the, the more thoughtful you are and cautious, you know, the better off you're going to be. So if this is a syllogism and we say, you know, chat GPT is generative, generative AI is good at helping you ideate. Well then therefore chat GPT is good at helping you ideate. So takeaway number one is that it's great for ideation. It's great for brainstorming. So you, if you want to write that down, write that down. That's the, definitely the best thing about it. Um, when Bill Gates saw this, and he obviously sees a lot of amazing technology, he was like, wow, I did not expect this to get so good so fast. Uh, I heard him speak at Tulane um, a year ago in New Orleans, and he, you could hear it in his voice how astonished he was at this technology. And so it's kind of hard for me to believe that was when I first heard about this coming up. And in a year, a lot has changed. So um Yes, it's going to continue to change. Um, Chief Justice Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court issued his 2023 year-end report on the federal judiciary, and he spent a lot of time talking about this. He said, legal research may soon be unimaginable without it. He said, courts will need to consider its proper uses in litigation. He said he predicts that while humans will be around for a long time, he has equal confidence that things will be significantly affected by AI and the legal profession, including the judiciary. And then lastly, he said, of course, you know, any use of AI requires caution and humility. And I think the reason he's using the word humility is because it is doing a lot of amazing things. And if we try to, you know, slough it off and ignore it, um, that's probably not the best um, approach to take. And this is from somebody who is not tech savvy. Ch Chief Justice Roberts says, you know, I'm not really tech savvy, but he can appreciate what's going on. So one question we could start asking is, um, you know, can ChatGPT think critically? Like, it seems like what it's doing is sort of thinking. Is it thinking critically? Is that what's happening? Well, let's find out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go in and we're going to say, I'm going I'm to pause this for just a second. So let's say I asked ChatGPT to kind of um, tell me a little bit about critical thinking. And this is part of the um, use of of this technology is that they call this prompting. So when you first use it, you're gonna to tend to think as I did, and as everybody seems to do, that it's kind of like using Google or some search engine, you know, you put in some stuff, search and get an answer. And yeah, that's how you kick it off, but really you're having a conversation. So it's taking what you say, it's kind of interpreting it. So you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to spell things perfectly. And it will take what you say and then provide an answer. So depending on how you prompt it, it will provide um, a different kind of answer. Now, if you prompt it exactly the same way continually, it's not going to provide exactly the same answer, even though you asked it exactly the same thing. 
that's because the way it generates its response is through kind of a predictive methodology. Like it's, it doesn't come up with the perfect answer and spit it out. I mean, you can see it generating it. It's, it's generating an answer. And what it's doing is understanding the general question and then predicting the next best uh, word or series of words to use based on the words that already come before it. And it's got a probabilistic element to it so that it's not always picking the exact same next word. And that's how it sometimes goes off the rails uh, depending, and we'll talk about that in a second. But so he here's the question we're going to put to it. Let's see what it says. So that's the question. Hit enter. See what happens. So you can see that it kind of has different speeds at which it responds. I'm going to pause it for a second. And so sometimes it kind of falters, then it picks up speed. So that's all part of the predictive nature. And that's also part of it accessing this large database and then also running its computation so that it can respond. So that computation has to happen over there where it's you know doing its computation. It's not happening on my computer. And that computer uh, might be busy or this question might be um, taxing it. You know, so that's why it kind of falters a little bit. But you can see it starts again, you know, just like it did with the outline, like, you know, here's some basic things to understand about uh, critical thinking. Um, you know, you understand, need to understand the rela relationship between critical thinking and decision making and problem solving and logical fallacies and biases and things like that. All right, let's keep going. So then that would be unit one, unit two. Now, again, I'm not, uh, the reason I'm asking it this in this way is I just want to get a general overview and kind of um, seed it with the understanding that I'm I'm looking at a broad picture of critical thinking before I drill into other questions, right? And that's kind of an approach you should take with prompting. It's like, go wide, you know, ask it a broad question, let it get it, give you an answer, make sure it seems like it's on the right track. And so you want to, you know, feed it this information in stages, even if you know exactly the, you know, complex question you want to ask it, I think it's still better especially when you're learning to use it, to force it to give you the information in stages so that you can analyze that in stages that helps you uh, critically assess it. All right, so that's the answer it gave us. Great, all right, now let's say, can you show me an example of a logical argument based on you know premises? Um, see what happens here. So I type that in into the same thing. So after it gave me all that information, I'm saying, all right, can you give me an example based on real world premises. So it's gonna say, okay, great. The old, you know, if this, then that. So that's an explanation of, uh, of you know, kind of the basic thing. Oh, wait, so let's see. Sorry, I, I repeated it. Um, so we'll let it do its thing here. So it's saying in a real world, world example, of this is like, you know, okay, here are two statements. If a person is under the age of 18, that's the premise, then they're considered a minor. That's the conclusion. So then if John is under the age of 18, then John is considered a minor. And that is a, is, is a conclusion that is must flow from those two. Like it's not probabilistic, it's, it's definitive. So that's, um, that's it answering that question. Okay, so we say, you know, can you give me an example from the world of law? Let's see what happens here. So again, this is, I just added this to the chat, like I'm continuing the chat. So it already knows everything I've already asked it. And now I'm going to add to what I've asked it. So presumably it's taking all of this into context. And here you get to see me typing, all right? In the world of law, modus ponens is often used to apply legal rules. And so this this is not like controversial. We know we know this is like you know basic law. Like if somebody knowingly breaches a contract, they're liable for damages. If A knowingly breached to B, then they're liable for contracting. Okay, so let's just keep going. Next one. Can you give me a generally real world example? Let's ask it that. In the ordinary world, we frequently find examples of statements that seem to prove a point, but actually don't. Can you give me an example of that? 
So then it says, oh, well, how about a non sequitur statement? Everyone at the office drinks coffee, therefore drinking coffee must be what makes them all so productive. Um, so it says, you know, the first part observes common behavior, everyone drinks coffee, and then jumps to this conclusion. Now, I think this is interesting because I think what's one of the big problems in the world today is people aren't thinking about what the underlying premise of anything is, right? They don't evaluate that. And as lawyers, that's what we do, right? We're trained in that. And um, of course, even if you're trained, you can slip up and not pay attention and, and fall prey to um, not seeing the, the disconnect. But th we're laying all this groundwork just kind of both for this, you know, search, but also for ourselves, because to me, what I feel like uh, generative AI is doing is something that looks a lot like critical thinking, but it's not. But if you are a critical thinker and you're going to, you know, question its premises or think about where it's likely to go wrong, then you'll be able to use it very well. If you don't do that and you act like people who just believe everything that they hear or read, you're going to have problems, at least for now, until it gets better. Um, so we could also ask it, well, why is that statement illogical? Let's let's explore this a little more. So we ask it to give us a little more information about that. And actually, all I did was cut off it telling us that. So I'm letting it continue. Why it doesn't prove the point. So it goes through a detailed explanation of why it doesn't prove this point. I don't know. I'm still astonished. This to me is, is really amazing. Um, so is ChatGPT capable of critical thinking? Well, just for laughs, let's ask it. <laughs> like, hey, Chad GPD, are you capable of critical thinking? Here you get to watch me type for, poorly. All right. So it's a lot of times, especially now, and I've noticed the evolution of how it answers. And in the beginning, it was the Wild West. And then now, because they've got, you know, OpenAI has gotten so much trouble, they usually have some kind of cautionary disclaimer at the beginning. But this one, for sure, it's going to nail because they know, you know, they need to address this. So there are some guardrails. The guardrails, you know, are tricky to put in because it kind of has to do its own thing. But in this one, it, it got it right. It said, you know, I don't possess consciousness or the ability to think critically in the human sense. My responses are generated based on patterns and, in, and information the data I was trained on following the instructions and guidelines provided. I can simulate aspects of critical thinking by applying logical rules, um, but these simulations based on algorithms and pre-existing data and not genuine understanding or consciousness, conscious thought. All right, so takeaway number two, generative AI is not capable of critical thinking. Therefore, do not rely on ChatGPT or other similar models too much, right? You need to do the critical thinking, right? Um, note this statement, though. It says, generated on patterns and information in the data it was trained on based on algorithms and pre-existing data. So let's maybe drill into that a little bit. What pre-existing data are you relying on? Let's just ask it and see what it says. So, you know, what pre-existing data are you relying on? So just tells us books, articles, websites, other publicly available written materials. And key thing, up to my last training cutoff in April of 2023. So OpenAI's ChatGPT4, um, actually I'm going to pause this for a second. ChatGPT4, the cutoff is April of 2023. So that large language model and the training, it stopped at that point. So it doesn't have any data, books, articles, websites, anything in its main database uh, uh, after April of 2023. Now, the, the newer versions of these things can supplement that by then going to the web. But then, of course, you're going to run into potential trouble there because... You know, it's just, it's the more data you give it and the more that data is unvetted, it can run into problems. So that's why we need to use our critical thinking. So let's continue. So, okay, is this, and I'm asking it, is this data what's referred to as large language models? Um, and I wanted to see what it would say about this. So let's see. Yes, 
LLMs refers to the type of AI model that I'm a part of. Um, trained on extensive data sets, um, large meaning lots of data, um, consists of even millions and billions of parameters. Now these parameters are adjusted during the training process by human people. But as we go from you know GPT-1 to two to three to four, and then soon five, the need for the humans to train it is diminishing and or the train or the humans are training it on more particularized things and again this is where you know people start to be afraid like well will the say i run off and do things on its own and the answer is no not unless somehow humans say yes well let's just let the ai do stuff without us you know monitoring it like yeah let's let's let it take over the nuclear um, launch thing, and it'll just launch nukes if it wants it. Like, not a good idea, right? So that's how we'd go off the rails. It's not from the AI taking over the world on its own, but by humans being careless. So um, we need to be careful. So takeaway number four, large language models or LLMs are, quote, the training data. The larger the data, the better the training, because it has access to more things from which to build its quote, understanding of how things work or how to talk about them. And then this is also where, if you think about when it gives a bad answer, the first question to ask yourself is, well, would that be the kind of data that it would have a lot of and that that data would be fairly consistent so that it could, you know, that it's gonna produce a consistent response or is it a situation where the data we're asking it to interpret isn't large and it doesn't have access to a lot of people saying the same things so that it can go, okay, well, this tends to be the commonality because the, th the thing that this uh, technology does is it's going to provide an answer. You know, you can't tell it like, well, you know, if you're not sure, then don't tell us, then it wouldn't work, you know, at all or very well. So it has to be told like you're going to have to produce an answer. So it's almost like the kid that you know didn't read the book report, but it's going to stand up confidently and say a lot of intelligent things. But if that kid had access to instantaneously to vast amounts of data and could just speak it, you know that's what we're talking about in a way. So if you think about it that way, and that is how I think about it, I'm not saying you have to, but that's how I think about it. It gives me kind of a clear, simple way of saying, oh yeah, okay, well if if it made up a case because somebody asked it a question, well, how many um, cases does it have access to compared to all the other data it has? Because it's not gonna, you gotta keep it in a small circle of, look, look, just look over here at this case law and use just that data. Well, then it becomes more reliable, right? And that's what these more specialized things that are you know, built just for lawyers are gonna do. But these are the key takeaways, right? Now, um, Let's ask it like, you know, data sources in your training. Uh, what data sources help you understand legal principles? Let's let's ask it about that. So what data sources in your training help you understand legal issues and principles related to the practice of law? Let her rip. So things you'd expect, like legal textbooks, case books, um, for various areas of law, academic and professional journals, legal opinions and rulings of court. And you have to remember that there's lots of case law that's out there that's open source, like Google Scholar, for example, has, I think, all the federal cases, many of the state or most of the state. So, you know, we're getting to that point where all of that information that relates to case law is most of it is publicly accessible. So it can go look at that, or it can look at CLE materials, it can look at legal blogs, it can look at statutes, you know, it can look at a lot of things. Of course, look at the bottom, it's saying, however, it's crucial to remember, you know, my responses are based on generated patterns, and I'm not a, it's not a substitute for professional legal advice. It's, there's the disclaimer. And of course, again, um, telling you about the knowledge cutoff of April, 2023. Um, so, does it really know where it got its training data from? No, probably not in the sense you know that we think of. Um, but let's let's go a little further. Let's say you ask it, I'm a first year law student taking a civil procedure course, and what are the topics likely to be covered? Now, I want to make one observation here is that 
when prompting these tools, one tactic that's, this is a foundational tactic, is you don't just ask it questions, you give it an orientation by saying, you are this person or you are this kind of person. And that helps it say, okay, well, if I'm that kind of person, then I'm either going to give a response based on being that kind, that kind of person, which now that sounds weird that it can do this, but that's kind of what it does. You know, it's one of its strange things, but it, it's really just a contextual prompt. And so if you wanted to answer questions, you could say, you know, you're a first year student, you're a law professor, you're a, you know, a veteran of law, and it's going to answer differently based on that. So if you're saying I'm a first year student, uh, what am I going to get when I take this class? It's assuming you don't know anything about civil procedure. You're going to law school for the first time. So let's see what it says in response to that kind of question. So paste it in, hit enter. I don't know, for me, this was a flashback. It's been a long time since I was in law school, but I do remember. Yep, we started with jurisdiction and venue. And we talked about pleadings and pretrial procedures. And we talked about discovery. Um, and I, I guess I sort of remember motion practice. Uh, trial procedure, I think we touched on evidence. We didn't go deep into that. I don't. Th I think we talked about appeals in general. I don't remember. We talked about post-trial motion. But yeah, we did. JNOV, things, stuff, things like that. And rest due to kind of collateral stop, I do remember that. And I do remember that I think this is true in most law schools that we use the federal rules of civil procedure because those are going to apply everywhere. Um, and, and we didn't get into state procedure. That was a separate class. So, yeah, okay, great. That That's the overview. Now, let's say I ask it again. I'm going to continue in the same chat discussion. What are some important cases related to personal jurisdiction? Because I remember the biggie, you know, which I think everybody remembers, Panoia versus Neff. Let's see, if we ask it that, is it going to spit out Panoia versus Neff? And so put that in there. What are the cases? Yep, there you go. Panoia versus Neff. And the old international shoe case. Um, and I went to law school in 1982, so... Um, this next one, Worldwide Volkswagen, which came out in 1980. That was fresh off the uh, burning press, so to speak. So that was the big one, you know, back then. And then that one was right after I got out of law school. I started clerking for a federal judge. And then these other ones, so that, you know, so those are all good, right? Um, and that's a good summary, right? Like when it nails it, if it zeroes in on the thing and the thing is valid, it'll nail it. Now, the things that, when it offers you something really specific, um, I look at those citations and I think it's pro those are probably correct because those cases have, have been cited so many times correctly all over the place, not just in legal databases, that it's probably going to get those correct, right? But let's we can find out. Let's site check Panoia versus Neff. So it said 95 U.S. 714. So if we want to site check that, I could get, I could say, okay, let's go to Google and I'll paste in that site um, just because that'll be probably good enough for Panoia. It wouldn't be good enough for most things. But I see, okay, yeah, there's Panoia versus Neff. And I can click on, you know, kind of, I can just look at all. It's They're all saying the same thing so that kind of tells me that's probably correct but if i click on the wikipedia article i can go read about panoia versus neff of course you know the place to check cases is not wikipedia or the internet we know that but you know as a down and dirty kind of like ballparking it you can go yeah okay well, that's probably correct all right now let's expand the context window what is the context window well what we've been doing is chatting with it and giving it a series of prompts, at some point, your the context window runs out. And each one of these tools has a limit. And um, ChatGPT3 had you know smaller limit than ChatGPT4. And ChatGPT4's context window is expanding. It's been expanding over the past year. All the other frontier models, like Gemini from Google and uh, Claude AI, 
um, which is owned by Anthropic, affiliated with Amazon, all of the those frontier models, their context windows are expanding. You know, no surprise. Uh, but the context window includes not only what is going into the chat, but it can be additional things that you can give it because you know in the year that's passed, um, these tools have now um, got to the point where you can upload documents into them and you can give them pictures and you and you can you know give them voice stuff. So you can add things to it besides what you're pasting in as text or what you're uh, typing in. So the context window can expand. So let's look at this. So let's get a legal document, specifically a memo in support of a motion to conduct discovery relative to personal jurisdiction. So I just went on the internet, found a place you know where there was one and it was the uh, DOJ's antitrust division. I came across this case, which I'm scrolling through the website and you can see, and um, there's an attachment to a PDF, but you can also just view it in here. But if I view it in here, I can't get it over into ChatGPT. So I gotta get the PDF. So I click on the PDF and then there's the PDF. And then I just have to download the PDF and I'm gonna download it, put it on my desktop, call it memo and support, hit save, and then it's on my desktop. So now I'm gonna go and say, let's upload this PDF and um, and see what it can do. So I click on the little um, paperclip button down here. And then it's gonna say, you know, what do you wanna do? I go grab that PDF, upload it, it takes a second to upload. And then I paste into it a simple question. I just please analyze this and give me a bullet point summary of the arguments. And then I hit send message. And this is another thing it's, that GPT is really good at, summarizing. It doesn't go off the rails too much with summarizing because it's got the document. It's not going to hallucinate. It might not get it exactly right, um, but it's going to get it really well. It's going to get it really good. And then you can supplement it by reading it. But I find personally that, um, I'm going to pause this for a second. I find personally that it's it's very valuable, even if I'm going to read the document closely, to, to get a preview of what that document is about in a summary. Because then when I go read it closely, I kind of already know what's coming. So I've gotten um, used to, and generally speaking, the case that I will use this tool to evaluate first, because even if it's not perfect, I'm going to go read it anyway, and I'm probably not going to remember the imperfections. I just need the, the executive summary. So let's let it continue. So it's giving a lot of really useful information. Like, great, okay, now um, let's get help with a reply. Let's see if it can help us ideate and think about how to um, how to oppose this motion. Okay, so let's do that. So I'm just gonna ask it because it's already provided all this information so I can continue the conversation and say, I wanna draft an opposition, what should I consider? Now watch this. This is this is <laughs> this still blows my mind. So you know, you could make up a form or a checklist and say, you know, here's what we need to think about when we look at um memos and and then refute them or whatever you could this could be like a form but if you think of this you think of this as like a dynamic form it'll do it on the fly specific to what you're asking it to evaluate so um one of the reasons why this technology has been deemed or found to be um more beneficial to people who don't have a lot of skill is that it does a lot of their thinking for them without them having to know as much or think as much. Now, somebody who has knowledge, it's still helpful, but it's not as helpful because they kind of already know this stuff. So this is another big takeaway, which I don't think I listed, it, but it's it's that the more you know about the domain in which you are using it, the better off you're gonna be because you're gonna understand intuitively where it's not quite on the right track or you'll know how to steer it in the right track, but the less you know, the more vulnerable you are. So. This is this came up in this uh, Bloomberg Law podcast with um, an interview with a woman named Catherine Forrest, who was a former federal judge 
in the Southern District of New York, you know, serious place to be a judge. And she left the, the bench and is now working for a big firm in New York, does antitrust type litigation. And this 15 minute um, podcast is, is, is worth listening to. And they began by the usual examination of, you know, why are lawyers making mistakes with this and talked about the, you know, the cases we've heard about. And then they brought uh, Catherine Forrest in and asked her, you know, how does she think about this? And she's on the firm's technology committee. She's very serious minded and, and cautious. And obviously she said, you know, you have to be careful about using these tools like ChatGPT when that, if there's um, public personally identifiable information, that could be compromised, not likely to be, but could be, if it was, that'd be bad. So you don't want to feed it that. Um, but she said that she was going to go give an argument in the Ninth Circuit, and she decided to um, have it evaluate the panel of judges that she was going to appear in front of. So once the panel had been determined, she said, OK, look, I want to know what kind of questions am I likely to get from these judges, which, you know, that that's something you'd want to know, right? And in the old days, you know, you'd have to know the judges really well and like read all this stuff. You know, it would just be a lot of things it would be hard to know. But with all of this data that's out there and available, that was publicly available, she said in a matter of seconds, you know, kind of along the lines of what we've seen here already, that it generated a bunch of really, you know, interesting questions that she knew were, was going to help her prepare better for uh, this argument that she was going to be giving. And she said, this was the kind of thing that if you gave it to a mid-level associate to do, it would take weeks, okay, weeks. So, you know, yeah, ideation is definitely one of its powerful uses. Summarizing is really powerful, um, but we can shift gears now and I can, because, you know, through the magic of being uh, online as I'm talking to you, I could you know, prompt ChatGPT if you want me to prompt. Uh, let's see, we don't have good camera set up, so I have to figure that out. Okay. I could prompt it um, if you um, if you want me to, but I'll just I'll just tell you this was the Bloomberg Law thing. I could link to that. This is Catherine Forrest that I was talking about. Um, one of the things I did because this is another tool I use. It's called Otter AI, and this to me is a a tool that every lawyer should evaluate and understand what the parameters of it are. It's been around for a while, a while before ChatGPT got to be big, but now incorporates GPT technology. And it's uh, you can try it for free forever. I think you, you get like 300 minutes per month or something. And then you'll probably want to use it for other things. And so I um, I wanted that, that interview. So I, what I did was I played it using speakerphone, put my phone with, which had Otter on it, had Otter listen to it. And, you know, I go to, I'll, if I go to a talk, like I went to a talk um, at Tulane University and there were great speakers, Michael Lewis, other people. And I just take my phone out and I record it because, you know, I want to know what I listened to and then review it later. But look at what it, it's doing. It gives this little summary and it says, you know, David Schultz, Catherine Forrest. Now, did it spell Catherine right? No, it got it, C. And I don't know if this name was correctly spelled. So one of the things with this AI, when it's transcribing, it's not going to be perfect, but it's good enough, right? Like the, the fact that it's that it's fast, that you can query it, that it gives you a bunch of different things to think about. And it says, for example, action items, review the Meta versus Avianca case. And I think it was Meta. Um, and that was the first case for that New York lawyer, um, you know, cited cases that didn't exist. Um, so it... it this tool assumes you want to use it possibly to to um, generate action items. You know, it's it's for summarizing meetings. It'll join a Zoom meeting automatically. It'll do all this amazing stuff that works on your phone. But look at the outline. So it's kind of got an outline and it just lays it all out. And then the other thing, I have to move this over here, which you can't see me moving. This, this is a Zoom thing. Um, but if you look at the comments, Actually, there's no there's no comments for this. One. Oh, I know what the problem is. This one because I I recorded it separately and it wasn't doing it dynamically. It didn't um, get comments. But like, let's look at for example. Um, I went to he hear Michael Lewis speak at this conference recently, and um, this one I took the trouble to highlight some notes and things like that because I wanted 
to use this and, and listen to it. So he talked about the book he wrote about Sam Bankman Fried, who got sentenced today. And uh, so you can see this outline of the discussion, which went on for 40 minutes. It's got an, it's got, um, did it not do this? Uh, okay, well, it, uh, it's got the transcript. Here, it's got a transcript. It has the summary. I guess the summary is, is what it is put under here now. But you can query it. So you could say like, oh, for example, it suggests something. Otter, how did growing up in New Orleans shape Lewis's career as a writer? It knows that was a question that was asked. So if I ask it that like, by clicking on it, it's going to say, you know, Michael Lewis discussed, he says, um, the storytelling culture of New Orleans. Yep, I remember him talking about that. He said uh, he was in the, uh, yeah, he said people in New Orleans are happier, they're less ambitious. So that kind of helps me remember what happened. But even somebody who didn't go to this talk could read the summary, could uh, read the outline and get a general sense of what happened here. So the, the, the purpose of a tool like Otter is mostly so that people who go to meetings can remember what was said or refer back to it, or that they can share that with people who weren't able to attend the meeting and those people can refer to it. And then if you're you know, reading along and you see in the transcript some part where you say, well, I want to listen to that, you can click on it and listen to it because you might want to make sure that what's transcribed is exactly what was said, right? So. That, those are some examples. Now, the other thing I want to um, show you is this this resource that I've shared the link with you with. This is where I just keep a running tab on everything related to ChatGPT, and I've got it organized under these broad categories, like you know, understanding AI and, and GPT generally. What do I use ChatGPT for? How do I prompt it effectively? Concerns about AI and GPT, and you know, the concerns, the main topics are hallucinations and accuracies, data privacy, deep fakes, fraud, deception, controversial topics, thing, military applications even. So something new comes up, I just drop it in here and the tool I use, I can do this on my phone. So, because this this is this is a moving target, this whole area. So uh, if anybody wants to ask me any questions or wants me to drill into any of this, uh, I'm happy to do it. Uh, but if maybe, maybe it's not if, um, possible, given how you're set up there, I don't know. Uh, but if you want to ask me questions, I think that would be useful. We have 12 minutes um, before I have to go leave for the Pelicans game. Um, but yeah, I, I want to make sure I answer questions that people actually have. This document will answer a lot of questions, but you know, it'd be more fun to get real questions. <laughs> well, Ernie, I'll step back to the podium then and see if uh, we have any from the group, bear with me a second. Okay. Sure. All right. Are you typing the questions here, or what are you doing? I guess we probably will type them in. I don't think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. We don't seem to have a camera set up. I'll, no worries. Uh, or I can probably just relay them. You can hear me on the microphone. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you. Lead us off, Steve. Yeah. Sure. So my question would be: Are there any tools available that are useful for calendar? Okay, good point. Yep. So, Ernie, the uh, tool, tool, I heard it all except for tools for what specific thing? For, for calendaring. Calendaring. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, so I guess one thing I should have maybe talked about is that, I mean, AI has been around for a long time. It's not, you know, GPT is not the first version of it. And so there are calendaring tools, tools that use kind of low level AI. Um, and, the the holy grail i mean it depends on what you want to do with a calendar but like one of the calendar tools that i was using for a while that had something like this was you know if you wanted to block out time on your calendar and say okay i'm going to work on this project for this time and you could put all these things in there and then it would dynamically determine if you didn't check it off it'd move it to a new day and it could you know it could make assessments about how certain types of things needed to be moved around in a calendar and I played with it to see if I would like it and it was cool. And then I realized like, yeah, you know, I don't really want an automated tool to be moving things around on my calendar. I need to be thoughtful about that, even though it may be annoying. And I think that this is a good example and a good time to talk about how, where I find that I 
I went on, I, I didn't use AI as effectively or automation as effectively is when you tend to go, you know, wild eyed, you know, enthusiasm. Oh, this is great. It's going to do all this stuff. And then you throw the stuff at it. And then you realize you having to clean it up or check it or think about it. It's more trouble than it's worth. So my, my opinion is that it probably can do that stuff. And at some point it'll get really good. And of course, if, one day to learn your preferences about lots of things. And if you have your own little private AI bot that's you know running for you, that'll happen. But I would say that's probably not an area of great opportunity. Um, it, you're more likely to wind up unhappy or wasting time. But I could be wrong. I have my own, I have a limited data set of knowledge, not a large data set. Fair enough. Yeah, knowledge. What practice area Um, specifically, I mean, you can answer it however you want to, but transactional versus litigation. Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know if you heard that, Ernie, but Molly was asking what practice area is chat GPT most appropriate for, effective for, and in particular, transactional versus litigation, something like that. So there are legal specific um, software coming out. And the two that I know the most about because the founders came and spoke to my online group. One is Spellbook and Spellbook is one that's for transactional lawyers and the transactional lawyers in my group who've used it, I would say 99% of them have kept using it even though the price went up and they grumbled about that. But they're, but it basically takes documents and does sort of that analysis of the document, suggests improvements, suggests boilerplate language, and so that kind of leg up that it gives transactional lawyers, they really like. And I think Spellbook still has a free trial, but I'm sure you could talk yourself into getting a free trial. And so if you're a transactional lawyer, I would definitely go check out Spellbook, you know, make an appointment, get a demo, ask them all the questions, you know, see if you can get a free trial and wrap your head around it with you using it and your practice with, you know, things you're doing. So that's the one for... Um, for transactional lawyers. Now, clear brief, um, this one I clearly see. Did I? Oh man, the um, yeah. So the the I have a video, but I, it disappeared uh, of the presentation that um, founder did. But you know, it, the basic message here is a similar thing, except it also looks at case law, obviously, and it will do evaluations of briefs. It will do evaluations of the the supplemental materials that go with briefs. And I, I, you know, I haven't used it because I don't practice law and I don't have a reason to use it. Um, it's similarly priced. And uh, the woman who created it, Jackie Schaefer, is amazing. She worked in a big firm. Then she was in-house counsel. She's not a techie per se, but she had this vision before the whole chat GPT thing blew up. So it's very well developed. Um, I would definitely, if you're, if you're a litigator, I would definitely go check out Clear Reef. Now, I know that Westlaw and Lexus are starting to try to do this too. My sense of this is that while those companies uh, want to get in the game and they, they're going to get in the game, they're big players, I think the advantage that Clear Brief has is still significant now. And also where Westlaw is coming from it is as research. And so they kind of have to think in a different way. Clear Brief has nailed it. They stuck the landing, you know, if you will. Just go use Clear Brief. And they definitely have a free trial. So I would check that out. And um, yeah, this is, this. if you look at this outline, you'll see it. And by the time you look at it, I'll go figure out why the Loom video that I had for this uh, disappeared. But um, yeah, those We've are We've got you on a too small a screen, unfortunately. So can, can you talk a little bit just briefly about what sort of things Clear Brief does? So it allows you to imp import relevant documents. Um, it'll do a quick search of facts and let you, you know, select text in an interrogatory and say, you know, find similar language. It makes it easier to copy and paste things. Um, it'll maintain consistent wording for objections and other legal language. Um, it'll support collaboration by allowing, you know, sharing of greatest hits older within a firm or outside counsel. Um, you can ask it questions and it all, and both of these tools, I should have mentioned this, they operate within Microsoft word. So 
that's what most lawyers use. Although I know there's some people like living with the Japanese, you know, prisoners from World War II who refuse to give up, you know, World Word Perfect. But uh, you know, it's another reason to leave Word Perfect. Word is is where it operates out of. Um So yeah, and it does OCR on the documents it uploads. It does site checking, fact checking. Um, so yeah, it's And what is the pricing for Spellbook and Clearbury? um, they used they were both about at one fifty. I think Spellbook has gone up to like two eighty or something like that. So that's when people started grumbling. That's what I'm thinking. And maybe yeah, and that. But the way I look at these kind of things is if people say. That's expensive. My question is always compared to what? Compared to you doing more of that work? Compared to you not feeling confident? Compared to you having to pay somebody to do that work? I mean, yes, it is expensive, but they, they're they not just tapping into chat GPT. They have to create additional guardrails and things that are applicable for lawyers. And of course, you want that. So they're not, they're not just charging a premium because they want to. I mean, I'm sure they're you know, charging... as much as they can, but it, it, none of the lawyers who've used it that I've been working with, even though they grumble at first, um, I think one person stopped using it just because they said, well, I was using it, but I didn't really need to use it that much. That was their reason. They said, I only use it like, you know, once every couple of months. Well, yeah, then it's not worth it, but everybody else is continuing to use it, but you'll know that if you sign up for it. And even if there weren't a free trial, uh, I would say, you look at it as an investment, say, I'm going to use it for a month. I'll pay the 150 or the 200, whatever, try it and get your head wrapped around what it can do. And you'll know if it makes sense or not, but only after you use it, that's the only way you're really, really going to know, you know, uh, I can't explain it all or convince you by telling you things, even if I did know, which of course I don't. Other questions? I guess one question I've got, Ernie, is in terms of chat GPT versus some of the specialized services you're talking about. Uh, what's your opinion as to which is worth it for, from a, from a perspective of a practicing lawyer? They're all at parity more or less. Um, and there's a guy named Ethan Mollick who's a Wharton professor. And I think I've linked to his articles, but he's the person I follow because I don't want to follow 10 people. If I can follow one who, who knows it, most of it and is the most sensible, he's the one I follow. And recently he did an evaluation of that exact question. And he said that they're all at parity for now. Um, and that Claude is be a little better at writing in general. And that chat GPT is, you know, it's generally good. And that Gemini is better at like ideation or something like that. But I will, what I would say is I wouldn't overthink that they all are, have a free version that is a lesser capability, which you can try and see, how it works. Like if you use Microsoft Bing, that has Copilot and their Copilot is based off of ChatGPT4. So you're basically using GPT4, the one that people are paying $20 uh, a month for. Now it doesn't save your history and it doesn't do other things uh, that ChatGPT4 does if you pay them the 20 bucks, but they're all charging 20 bucks a month for the premium version, but they all have some slightly lesser version what I would say is I pick one and just use that one. And then after you get good at using that one or, you know, and you want to try something else, maybe try another one just so you can kind of see like, well, how does that compare? Because I've found that I, I use Claude and GPT-4. Those are the two I use. Uh, Gemini's newer, so I just haven't bothered to go mess with it. But um, I found that Claude sometimes would answer questions better. And Claude was the first one to let you upload documents. So I guess I used to use it for that. But it, if you compare them, you'll find that, you know, 90% of the time they're the same or roughly the same. Every once in a while, one does a better job. So, you know, it's nice to have the option. Uh, but I would definitely pay the $20 for one of them and use the hell out of it. Um, Ethan Malik said that until you've used it for 10 hours, um, you're not really... going to understand it. And I think that's true. It, these don't come with an instruction manual. <laughs> There's no way you can be taught how to use it by somebody else, because for one thing, it's evolving so quickly. So by the time they teach you, you know, it's not exactly going to be, you're not going to think about it the same way. But I think the sooner you use it, the better, because here's my metaphor for this. You know, if you, if one day these things are like riding a hundred foot wave, which is amazing and awesome, 
you don't want to learn to surf on a hundred foot wave. You want to learn to surf on a three foot wave and then, you know, keep getting better as the waves get larger. And then you're going to be like king of the hill. So the sooner you start using it just to wrap your head around what it can do and use it for everything that isn't threatening. Don't, you know, use it for anything that, that is, it doesn't require you to have to think about uh, how public or private data works. Like Catherine Forrest did. She's like, Oh yeah, this is fine. I can ask it, you know, what questions will the panel give me? She did that, good to go, right? So use it for as many things as you can, and you'll know what those things are and get started as soon as possible. That is my, I'm shouting this from the hilltops. <laughs> All right. Well, we know you got a hard stop. We really appreciate the time, Ernie. Uh, you all can join me in thanking Ernie. For his time. <laughs> absolutely. Happy to do it. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Absolutely. And go visit Ernie, the attorney on Google. And, uh, yep. Ernie, thanks again for, uh, for your generosity, and we'll let you get to your game. All right. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Take care.